Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Bang on Sale show. I'm your host, Mark Bangs, and this is the first time this has ever happened. We're back for a part two with Mr. Peter Barkley of Sales Geek. Um, this is a really good one, right? So the first episode, and definitely watch that first, we were talking about, um, run with Peter, we were talking about like perceptions of sales and how a lot of business owners and, and hiring managers, they sort of misunderstand what sales is all about, right? And that influences. Yeah. Them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we, I probably went into a bit of a, uh, a preaching session, but I think for me, it's, it's, you know, lots of small businesses that I target my business at, the MDs don't understand sales. Um, and they think about that kind of all the negatives and that perception of sales mean that they just don't embrace it. They, they're scared of it. They're frightened of it and they mm -hmm. run. So, um, we kind yeah. of covered that well enough going yeah. through everybody's perceptions and how we, we as salespeople have to start changing that and kind of changing the way people perceive sales because it's a really, really important part of life and business to me. Um, yeah, so so today we're going to talk a little bit more about how that influences uh, hiring decisions and also onboarding. And that's this is a subject that's actually quite close to my heart because I've been sort of, uh, for some of my career, I was a sort of quintessential job hopper um for reasons that we'll probably get into uh during this conversation so um peter could could you maybe just share your thoughts on that sort of pre-hire process like the recruitment process that businesses go through because i know that you know everything from the selection process to the interviewing to you know how cvs are assessed that's that that is all influenced by the way that an md or whoever they're, they're, how they perceive sales in general, doesn't it? Could you talk about that? Yeah, exactly. I think, I mean, to me, it's, it's like everything. There's polls, isn't it? You get a kind of a PLC corporate event uh, side of things, which is all about disc profiling and creating really rigid uh, profiles and it is really kind of KPI-driven and process-driven. Um, and I'd say for me, I'm, I'm really focused on the kind of SME background. And small businesses have that kind of negative perception of sales. So they take the exact opposite Um and they don't really embrace sales and they don't really understand the, the, the different dynamics of sales and how different personalities affect in the way that your kind of profile and personality makes up what type of person you are and therefore will really influence the type of salesperson that you'll become. Um, and they just think, we'll go and get a salesperson. They, they go out and they, they recruit somebody who's got a really good gift of the gab and can talk a really good game. Um, and then you see that kind of stereotypical revolving doll situation come in because they don't understand it. They then employ somebody. They don't end up to support them properly. They don't get the return quick enough. They're probably unrealistic about how quick they want that return. Um, after six or eight months, they start to get frustrated and they pick all the negatives of what that person doesn't do. They don't pick any of the positives. Um, the relationship falls apart. They then go back out to recruiting agents uh, market and all they do is base their entire opinion on what that last person was like and they go and replace that person with somebody who's completely different they never actually drag themselves back and say okay so what do we need you know what type of salesperson do we need for our business you know is it a key account manager or is it somebody that's in business development uh, you know is it somebody who's going to be really outgoing that can network that can build relationships but, and you know, really do that kind of you know cold calling aspect of the role but accepting that person might not be the most detailed person you know they might not be able to deliver the detailed projects they might not be, be very good at key account management so for me you know I spend quite a lot of time with people saying okay so let's have a look at your customers and let's look at what they require and how that process of sales is and how you want that process to be managed and then think about the two parts, the, the KPIs and targets and the process that the person needs to follow. And within that, you get the playbooks and the stories, but also then have a look at the personality of understanding. Yeah, is it somebody you want attention to detail or is it the big picture guy? Is it uh, somebody who's really reserved, but can build really intense, longer, you know, long lasting relationships? Or is it that somebody when we were talking about beforehand that you can a sales trainer type person, you, know, you can go into a room and just, full fill the room full of energy instantly um but you know those people if you you land up working with them on a day-to-day -day basis and you land up having a really close relationship that energy can be quite irritating so they're not the best people to build long-term relationships and trying to scope all that out to me is where small businesses they just don't think about um 
and for me, it, it's all based around and built from that perception of sales. You know, it's, we don't like sales, we don't understand it, so therefore, let's not embrace it. Um, do you um, do you think because you mentioned disc profiling there, and I guess it's something that smaller businesses think about a, a lot less, but it, it's relevant to understand. You said about understanding your customer as well, and depending on the type of person or people that you're selling to, that 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 surely should be considered as well. I mean, I'm thinking, for example, you know, I've, I've, I've sold to IT managers um, and also sold to other salespeople. And it, they're completely different, you know, in terms of personality type, probably their disc profile, that sort of thing. Um, so surely that influences the, the type of, from a personality profile point of view, the kind of person that you should be looking for. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, you know, I always try to sit down with clients and say, okay, you know, map out who your customer is. And, and they immediately think, oh, you know, it's an engineering company. So, you know, they have that one view that everybody within that business, because it's an engineering business, are all engineers. But then you're like, oh, no, within that, there's buyers, there's project managers, there's engineers, there's operations guys, yeah, health and safety people. There's a whole mix of different personality profiles within that. Um and they all influence the sales process. You know, there's not such a thing as a buyer within the business. There can be four or five. So we talk about those kind of like the gates and the kickers and the influencing um, your, your key points. And you even think it down to the kind of the value triangle about how you speak to individual peoples and what the, the individual things that you need to speak about and highlight within your conversation. They all influence that sales process. But fundamentally, if you've not got the right personality to sell to those people, they'll be ineffective because the fundamentals of sales, as you and I know, is building trust, it's building the rapport. So if you're an engineer, but then you have a really hard-nosed sales guy, they'll, 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 they'll never be able to work. So if you actually sit down with kind of MDs and small businesses and say, okay, so let's map out your customer, what type of customers do you sell to? They talk about the business profile and they take about the type of businesses they sell. Um, but then you say, okay, so what about the people? How many people within that business influence the sales process? And it's amazing. It blows my mind the amount of people that just don't know it. You know, they turn and say, oh, we'll get the orders from this buyer. You know, okay, he's a buyer, he processes the orders. Great. Who creates a specification? I don't know. Yeah. Who else will influence that, that, that buying decision? Don't know. Yeah. So you, you're right for me I always try and map out the clients understand the clients understand the influences and understand the structure and the, the kind of reporting lines to understand that dynamic within your business and once you understand that then you can map out the type of person that you want to be interacting with that business and yeah the difficulty with with small businesses against yeah, kind of PLCs PLCs have that kind of multi-led relationships where you have lots of different people having relationships with lots of different people within the organization mm -hmm. but in a small business you can't have that um you know and, and mds have been the main salesperson in the business themselves and built the business themselves they kind of wear all those hats and they can switch the hats from one to the other to, to kind of scope out how they speak to people um but once again they don't understand that they do that um, yeah yeah and I, I suppose without um blowing our and our trumpets too much that, that i suppose that's where people like us can help businesses to some extent, right? If they haven't gone through this exercise of the account mapping of really understanding all the stakeholders, the people that are involved in that buying process, um, you know, and I imagine that's probably some of the work you do, right? Is to understand like who are the two, three, four, five people that influence that decision along the way to kind of map out what that. Yeah, looks exactly. Like. Yeah, exactly. You know, map out, you know, what the customer journey is like. So for me, mm -hmm. it's, it's how, your customer interacts with your business and all the different people interact with that business. And to me, it's right down to yeah, who makes the deliveries, you know, yeah. who who is going to the award ceremonies and speaking with the MDs and the chief execs. Yeah, if you actually map out that entire business and understand the kind of the pyramid of how they work, everybody that interacts with that business at different levels has a sales job to do. Yeah, you know, even your finance people, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, have some form of yeah, sales function within their role to fact find or gather information to enable you to understand your competitors, or sorry, your customers better than 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 your competitors to enable you more to be more effective and sell. Um, but then you map that right down to your individual salespeople. As I say, within the big business, you can get three or four people. You know, if you look at the in my background, you know, we had guys that were 
guys and girls that were very focused on working with landscape architects because they were all design, didn't talk about cost, didn't talk about anything. It was all about you know, ethically sourced and environmental benefits and life costs and aesthetics. And it was all very much design led. But then through the construction industry, as that sales went through the contractors, you'd then get into the delivery and you'd talk about project managers and installation processes and you know, all that. And then we would trade quite often through builders and merchants. So then you'd be dealing with a distribution network, which ultimately just saw product codes on the screen and wanted to buy at the cheapest price they possibly could. So for me, we would have three or four different roles would fit all those different functions, but a small business, you would try to get one person to do that whole thing. So for me, we go in there, we map out those people, map out how important each are and where the major influences are and who the major influences are within that process and try to scope out the personalities. But also, as we spoke about before the call, you know, your storybook and your play cards and all that kind of stuff to make sure that the people have all the right tools to enable them to talk from day one effectively to sell. Yeah. Okay. So so that I suppose we've, we're talking about sort of screening, pre-selection, understanding yep. what those criteria are. So what, what about when you get to the point where, you know, in interview stage, essentially, so you're sitting in front of a potential hire what does that look like? What kind of things should you be looking for? Um, you know, what good questions to ask? I mean, you can go as, as high level or as granular as you like on this, Peter. But I think there's a, you know, initially it comes from the job spec and the personality spec of the person, doesn't it? It's understanding those key points. Um, putting the major red flags. So look at the look at the things you definitely don't want with most people. Um, and then for me, it is it's really delving into the um, the people's experience and the people's history. Um, to really sort of go below the surface. Um, and, you know, I've sat in a few interviews quite recently with people, and it's instantly asked the first question of, you know, wherever it might be, you know, do you sell into the builder's motion market? And they're like, yeah, yeah, great. Do you have some really good relationships with those people in builder's motion? Yeah, I know everybody. Awesome. And then they stop the conversation. Yeah. Do you mean it? And move on to the next question. Okay, to me, delve. My next question would be, okay, so who are your top three customers? And what would your top three customers say if I phoned them today? What, what, what would they be? Can you name those three, top three customers? And try to actually understand the level of detail and the, the kind of, um, yeah, how much substance is behind that throwaway comment in the front. But that's all driven by your job spec, you know, what you want that person to do, what you want the, the person to be like, what customers are going to sell to mm you know, what type of person they are. Um, and then, as I say, all the red flags of all things you definitely don't want. Yeah. But that, I mean, that natural instinct to ask, to to dig and peel back the, the layers of the onion, that's that's just your, your sales experience there, isn't it? And and, and again, it speaks to, if, if you don't have that as, and you're an employer, you just have to, I suppose, remind yourself, just dig those extra couple of layers deeper with each question, you know, ask for examples, be more, more granular with it right yeah and i mean it's the most difficult thing in the world to do isn't it yeah oh yeah if, if you if you ask me to you know interview an operations director i would really really struggle because he would blow me away with you know within the first five minutes of conversation he would come up with some yeah terms and phrases and all that sort of stuff which i've heard of thousands of times but how do i how do I really scrape the surface and, and get below that and really understand it? Um, and it's one thing that for me with small businesses, that I don't think they do value. And I've always, since you kind of throw in that recruiting agency into that and how their role fits. But for me, getting a really good at recruiting agency that really understands your business and really understands the personalities that you need and the types of people you need, they should be screening those people before that um, to help you create... Um, create a really good shortlist of clients and um, problem is a lot of SMEs they don't you know flip from recruiting agency to recruiting agency they don't build intimate relationships with any of it they don't get any value from those recruiting agencies um, so they then end up doing it themselves um, and they have no expertise to, to interview them so yeah what's the chance of being successful no, if... well and then I bet a lot of the time you just get sick of the whole process and just oh you'll do <laughs> yeah exactly and you know especially in the process of they get that first person and they land up, it doesn't work out and they land up replacing them. You know, they, they, the amount of people who would just go and pull out the same job ad they had whatever, 12 months ago, put it straight on Indeed. 
get mm-hmm. flush five CVs because in the back of their mind, they're thinking this person's leaving the business quite quickly. And you know, if you're a new start, it can be a month before you're leaving, sometimes less. So that situation of God, we've got to get somebody in really quickly. So they yeah. chuck a indeed dad out, you know, 24 hours after this person handed a resignation. In. They have five CVs in their desk within a week. They've interviewed the five people and they're making an appointment within three or four weeks. Um, but then if you go and you ask the fundamental question, okay, so the last person failed. You're using exactly the same advert and information to recruit your next person. You expect that next person to be more successful than the person. You know, that's, that's madness, isn't it? It's, it literally is different. Oh, and, and, and also the, um, and this, this segues nicely into what we were going to talk about with um, what, what comes after that, right? So not only are you using the same job spec, the same interviewing process, selection process, but you, you give them the job, and then you're onboarding your training or lack thereof um, the way that you're actually enabling that person is, is exactly the same as the person who failed. Right. Yeah. So, so could you, could you talk a bit about, well, perhaps I'll, I'll set the, set the a bit of context here. So for me, it's usually, if I've joined a business as a BDM or an account manager, usually it's, you know, here's, here's a, here's a mobile, here's a laptop. They give you a tour of the CRM. And then you get an email that's got about 20 PDFs attached, all with product stuff. So you've got all of this product info spinning around in your head and CRM and all of this. And then and then that's it. You're off to the races and then that's it. Go make it rain. Go make it happen. And yeah, yeah so I mean, that, that that's quite common though, isn't it? Um, yeah, then- definitely. Or, or you're given a, you know, you're, you're passed over to kind of the longest serving members of staff and you give them a factory tour and they talk you through products exactly there's no there's no structure within what they're talking about and then if it is a business that's had that revolving door and it's the third or fourth person they've tried to do that induction for over the space of two or three years yeah i've actually been in that situation where the people who are inducting you turn around and say oh yeah you're another one i wonder how long you'll last Exactly. Yeah, they're so jaded by that point. I'm I'm a few weeks into this, a few days into this role, Mm. and you can just tell by the whole body language of the people who are giving you an induction. Yeah. God, another sales guy. Dear God, do I have to do this again? Yeah. Yeah, please. You try and draw out some enthusiasm. So literally, just you know, yeah, it's crazy. Um, but the thing for me is, is that the it's also that appreciation of the entire sales process. You know giving somebody a product catalog and going read that catalog and learn those products now go and sell them how much of a you know an md who's created a business and created a really good business and been the male salesperson how much of the information that they have in their brain that they use to sell is in that product catalog or on the website um and quite often what i'll do within my you know, within the sales group, well, I actually turn around to an MD. I did it with, with a client the other day and said, right, okay, for the next hour, you're going to sell your product to me. Yeah, you, know, you actually pretend I'm a client and I'll I'll scrutinize you and you sell the product to me. And they'll, they'll start selling and what they'll do is they'll pull out a bit of paper and they'll come to a problem where they find it hard to explain something. They'll do a sketch or they'll have a sum or an equation or, or something they'll use and they'll put it down on a bit of paper and they'll do that and they'll pass over to that, that explains it all. You're like, that, that's great, perfect. So you get to the end of that hour of like, role play. You turn around and say, see all that bundle of paper that you've scribbled on? How much of that do you tell your sales guy? Why would I do that? You know, that's, yeah, sales script wise, that's the playbook, isn't it? You know, that's the, if you come against this objection, this is what you use to prevent or to get over that barrier. Um, yeah. but they automatically imagine that if you're a salesperson, you know how to respond to those answers. You, you, you sell, so that's your job. But if you don't have the information to put an informed decision or an informed answer in front of a client, then very quickly you lo- lose credibility and you lose trust with the client because the client will see through you. They, they see that you're sandbagging it like mad and you're blagging your way through the meeting is, you know, yeah. And then you walk away and the sales guy doesn't get the doesn't get the sale. You can like, why wouldn't? Yeah. Um, what do you think of this? So I I um I pulled out this excellent book in preparation for this conversation, uh called Agile Selling. I think it might be reversed, but Agile yeah. Selling. Yeah, yeah. I think it's out of focus. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, it's a little bit. Nice. Really, really good book. Um, one of the things she says in this is, um, as from the point of view of the salesperson, a really good thing to aim for, in particularly in the first sort of 30 days, if you join a new business, a new industry or, or whatever, is to develop what she calls situational credibility, which is basically mm-hmm. the ability to hold your own in a conversation with a with a, a buyer or a potential yeah. a, a stakeholder, whatever, um, which really comes from flipping. It's, it's the inverse or the opposite of filling your head with product knowledge. It's more about understanding the, the customer first, right? Yeah. What their world look like, the pains, the gains, all of that stuff. Um, because I think what you're saying there about credibility and the, the trust and so on, if you can at least have a conversation with them and understand and just, even if it is at a fairly surface level, you can, it's, that's something to build on, isn't it? In terms of that relationship, rather mm-hmm. than going in and saying, Oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm managing your account now. And then you walk in with your, your catalog, as, as you said, and start pitching the latest deal that you've got running that month or something like that. I mean, what, what are your thoughts? Do you think that that's a good approach or is it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I actually think that, yeah, I, I, I was once recruited by somebody who, who turned around after the interview um, and said, that's the first interview I've been in where I felt like I was being interviewed. I said, like, what do you mean? He said, you were asking me more questions and scrutinizing me more about the business and what my induction would be on and all that side of things than I was asking you about you. And my response was, well, that's what a sales guy should do. You know, uh, and so when I say that kind of onboarding process and recruitment, it, it's kind of flawed. The salespeople themselves have taken a lot of responsibility into that because you know, they've gone through the interview process as well. So for me, and it's a bit like you know, your, your agile selling, but yeah, if you've got a salesperson who's sitting there and is really, really scrutinizing what the introduction processes would be, you know, what the routes to market, how to company sell, how do they differentiate, asking about your competitors, asking about you know, all that kind of stuff and trying to really understand how you sell, not what you sell. And if they're doing that within the interview process, then that becomes that kind of springboard because they hopefully will bring that straight through the induction process. So through the onboarding process, they won't be that quiet person sitting in the corner in complete silence just trying to consume all the information. They'll be probing and they'll be asking and they'll be you know really scrutinizing <clears throat> what the people who are doing inductions are trying to teach you. Um, so I do think that you're you're right, you know, it's it's not about trying to sell products good modern salespeople are, are about resolving problems and about asking about you know, using language and using questioning to take people through that process to really understand what their problem is and then come up with solutions with it um and you know <clears throat> sorry being able to do that really effectively is a real art and a real skill um, and then to me that suddenly is a massive massive tick in the box because suddenly you've not got somebody who can think in their feet and has got a bit of a gift of the gap. You've got somebody who really follows a bit of process and yeah, understands what they have to do and what their job entails. Yeah, and and I'll, I'll, I'll go kind of a long way to get to this. So I, I think and tell me if you agree or disagree here, but I think a lot of um a lot of salespeople, particularly more junior people, because I mean I, I suppose I'm talking from personal experience here. Mm-hmm. I would feel uncomfortable asking too many questions or, or digging too many layers deep within a certain line of questioning if speaking to a to a client to a prospect because i would be afraid that i should probably have the answer to that i should know i feel like i should know that and i put the onus on myself to be to, to, to know them more than i do when i think as you as you progress and as you kind of just just chill out you realize well actually even if you should have the answer to that it always helps to clarify and to just to dig in and even to get them to because it's almost a uh, a process of coaching someone through a process as well isn't it by helping them helping the client to reach their own decisions um even if you, you've already got do you know what i mean you've got the outcome in your yeah, mind yeah i mean you, someone there. you know i always say it's you know the, the worst or the biggest biggest um faux pas of sales is assuming things not sense checking next dot not double checking you, know, you yeah. see that you know the new person on board they'll go to the first meeting they'll come out from the first you know the first month you're almost guaranteed they'll walk away from the meeting saying oh, i met this great guy he's gonna revolutionize this business he's gonna give us you know 
10 times more business. He's going to do all yeah. of this sort of stuff. And, you know, I'm going to get the orders really quickly. There's, you know, there's no reason why he loves us and everything. There's, there's literally not a single reason why that customer's not going to buy. But he never does. Because the salesperson sat there and just absorbed all this positivity and thought, oh, this makes me feel really good. So I'm going to ride that wave rather than stopping it and saying, okay, let's really try to remove the assumptions and sense check it all. Um, and for me, you know, that should be what salespeople do. And as you say, it's really difficult when you're in the beginning of your career. Um, but then that's, once again, it's the personality uh, profile of the person you're trying to recruit. If you're trying to recruit, you know, a 4,000 pound a year key account manager who's going to be managing half a million pound accounts and, you know, has 20 years of experience, you'd expect that person to have the confidence to scrutinize you. Um, if you're employing a 19 year old school leaver to work in a telesales office as a sales administrator, of course it will. Um, but you would go into that meeting. But then <clears throat> there's personality profiles behind that and personality. Uh, types behind that, you know, it's that kind of outgoing person. If you have somebody who's sitting at 19 years of age and is yeah, into drama and all that kind of stuff and really outgoing and boisterous and, you know, really confident, then you can teach them the language and you can teach them what to to do. But what you can't do is take somebody who's incredibly reserved and incredibly nervous and teach them to be outgoing. So within that personality aspect, understanding the types of people you want and making sure you stick to those people is really key. Um, so I, I know you said your question was going to be long. Well, no, no, so my answer is more so. Um, but yeah, the, it is as I was telling you, it's been able to answer questions and scrutinize and use language in the proper way to get to the right answer. Yeah. And it, yeah, so I was, I'll get to the, the bit I was taking the long route round to. So, you know, you said about having the gift of the gab, thinking on your feet and so on. And I think that by taking that approach, you almost, yes, you you want to be flexible in the moment and be able to think on your feet, but you almost don't need to do it as much because you're just, you're more open and curious rather than I need to, oh, if they say this, I need to say that. And I know I understand in sales, a lot of the time when the stakes are high, you've got 20 different scenarios playing out. I could go this way or that way, but you don't need to be as fight or flighty. Do you know what I mean? If you're just curious and you, you're you okay asking questions and clarifying certain points and and only doing 20% of the speaking rather than 80% of the speaking. Yeah, exactly. That's what was, for me, that goes back to the, the point of the podcast and there's the kind of the induction process. Yeah. And it takes it away from giving somebody a product catalog and saying, learn these products. Yeah. And give them that playbook behind that and say, okay, so that person's interested in the, the product we know the type of customers who will buy that product mm. will need this, will need that, will won't need that, won't need this. This is the four or five questions that you need to ask. Um, so it's creating that kind of a informed decision to enable the people to be sitting there with the confidence and information to make a decisive, uh, uh, sort of make the decisive question and probe really effectively. Mm -hmm to do that um, and a sales process breaks down because new salespeople don't have that level of detail and level of knowledge um, behind that and you know I've done it you know come, come away you know, I've been that typical sales guy to come back into the office and go yeah yeah I'm going to get a sale this is amazing and somebody in the office will turn around and go that will never happen why won't it happen and then I'll come up with five reasons why that won't happen and, okay so if you'd put that into the induction process when I was in that meeting I would have used those five points and questioned them those five points to be able to sense check what the client was saying to, to, to quantify and qualify the sales lead. You know, it's taken them through that pump funnel yeah. in the, the correct way. So taking it, if you think about that, yeah, top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottle of funnel, taking it from a, well, what's the difference between a marketing qualif qualified lead and a sales qualified lead? it's a salesman will be drilling it down to make sure that there's an actual understanding of what the client's problem is and what the client needs rather than just a loose inquiry into a product. Mm -hmm. But in the initial days, the induction process, you should be arming the salesperson to make those questions in the right way. Okay. So, um, so I suppose as a, as a bit of a closing uh, thought, what, at a higher level, what should we be including in a playbook when bringing salespeople on? I mean, you've obviously touched on a few things such as 
uh, understanding who is our customer, who are the people involved, good questions to ask, things like that. Is, would, would you add anything else to that? What, what would you typically include? I think it, you know it's it's all the the tools the the yeah it's the diagrams it's the graphs it's the case studies it's the um, previous sales processes the complaints the issues the problems the successes it's all of that sort of stuff to to create a really rounded and informed view of the product rather than the product just being that isolated product you know it's the whole uh, yeah. Well, is it the reason why it's all about selling the why, isn't it, rather than the what and how? Yeah, I'm not selling a, a, a product that's isolated, that doesn't interact, that is completely soulless. It's not just a commoditized yeah. issue. And and th there's no such thing as a completely commoditized product where it's just literally on price. To me, there's always a bit more of a decision-making process behind that. And I think a really good sense check, and I'd say to anybody, is if you're trying to recruit a salesperson, Take the three or four people who currently sell in your business in whatever manner and sit them down and say, pitch to me, mm. you know, and and get a blank bit of paper and make them do the scribbles and all that sort of stuff and take notes of all the different your stories about when things went bad and when things were good. And to me, that's the story behind the product. Um, and if you can get all of that down in paper and give that to the salespeople and say, okay, so this is your product, but this is the background behind it. Yeah. Okay. Like it's that. not his. It's not his stories. Somebody else's stories. But at least it's a point of reference, isn't it? Um, and it puts understanding behind it. It puts everything into into a real life scenario, so people can understand it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's that's what we do. You know, it's sell by stories, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it. And um, yeah. So it's it's just put a different way it's, it's understanding not just like you say the product in isolation it's like i don't know it's a silly example but my again it's pretty reversed but my my daddy mug right yeah. this isn't just a mug it's it's more than that there's a sentimental thing there it's it's the enjoyment yeah. of my my cough my first coffee of the morning you know when i get up yeah. peaceful morning you know what little piece i get these days you know yeah um, exactly so and and it's understanding the place that your product has in your broader the customer's broader ecosystem their world right and the relevance and yeah so on so and you know you, your daddy must plan example you know yeah it's your first coffee it's the the inanimate objects and the vessel that gives you a caffeine rush first thing in the morning mm. but then at three o'clock in the afternoon when you're having a really really crap day and things are going really bad you look at your mug and you you know, the the reference to your son puts the perspective of yeah. why you're doing all these things into perspective and that gives you a bit more motivation mm. yeah so it's it's not an inanimate object it, it's it's very symbolic to you um yeah, yeah. and and to me it's that and maybe the mug scenarios are taking it to a different extreme but you know what i mean it, it's that whole backstory it, it's taking a picture of everything you know why yeah. does that mug mean so much to you because mm. yeah i don't know your your wife bought it for you and your the first birthday of your you know your first birthday when you were dad mm -hmm. and it may not even come from your son or daughter but it makes that reference doesn't it mm -hmm. and that, that mug is important to you for many more reasons than just carrying a coffee yeah my bo my boring mug <laughs> I'm just going to show the picture my boring mug is a boring mug and that is just the best one um, do you know what I mean right? I've got similar mugs as well they look like um something you get in a a shared office space or something, you know, like in a yeah. conference room. Or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but exactly. But it's that, it's that whole, it, it, you know, it is, it's given that whole context to your product, isn't it? It's understanding the background yeah. behind it and able yeah. to do that. Um, and it is very much that selling the stories. It, it's, it's, you know, <clears throat> there's nothing worse than somebody turning around and saying, you know, buy this because your customer turns around and says, oh yeah, but it doesn't do you. And the sales guy not having a response or giving a very, very yeah, clinical answer. Yeah, almost the catalog says. But if you turn around and say, yeah, yeah, you're completely right, but you've ever thought about this situation? Because in our past history, you know, we were experiencing you know, this this happened, and because this happened, this happened, and that was the problem, and this is what happened. Um, so therefore, that's why your statement's incorrect. You know, that that becomes a lot more 
irrelevant. It has a lot more power to it and has a lot more control to the conversation than just saying, yeah. And, but, uh, and again, and again, and uh, we're, we're laboring the point here, but that is the personality. That's the person you're trying to hire for who's then going to say, like, what, why why do you why do you need that feature why do you need that widget whatever it is and, and let them answer and then and then actually well to be honest we actually hear that quite often but it turns out that in half of cases it's not actually needed or they end up not really using it here's a use case to to back that up or you know something like that but it's it takes a certain level of i suppose just confidence really to do that doesn't it to actually challenge someone in that in that scenario yeah, and exactly. And I think you know, take, take the whole conversation right back to the beginning. Of, you know, exactly that is, you know, if you've got that uh, situation where it is a hard sell and your clients will push back a bit more, then your personality spec, your person has got to be somebody you can be thinking of for feet and has got a bit of confidence and has a bit of an air about them. And, you know, but is also brave enough to sit there and say, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know the answer to that. But I'll find out for you. I'm not sure in the business you can. Yeah. Um, and but all those sort of things to me, if you position your interview process right and you're well prepared for your interview process and you know exactly what you need, those personality traits will come out in an interview. You know, how many people, as you say, it's very difficult and for for younger people. Um, but I think I must have been 30, 35 years of age before I sat in an interview process and said, I don't know. You know, when I was 24. I thought I had to answer every single question perfectly. Yeah. But you get to you get to more a senior age and you get a bit more experience, you turn around and say, Do you know what? Never come across that. Hey, that'd mm. be interesting. Mm. Um so having that confidence to do that with an interview process is exactly what you want the people to do within the sales process. Love it. And then yeah, we said it in the, the, the first podcast, you know, it's perception of sales. Everybody's a salesperson. If you're in an interview process, you're selling yourself. If you're in a sales call, you're selling a product or service. Um, so if you can't sell yourself well, no, you sell the product well. Brilliant. Well, look, Peter, on that note, thank you. Um, thank I loved you it. Again. I knew this was going to be a good one, and uh, at least from my point of view, it didn't disappoint. So um, yeah, I look forward good. to getting back on this. Um, we've got about a minute left. Uh, yep. Do you want to tell us about yourself, about Sales Geek. Where can people find you? All that good stuff. Yeah, I mean, Sales Geek. You know, we're all over the country. I, I don't know how many of us. There are now about 20, 30 of us all over the country. We're now in the US. We do a whole pile of apps and um, online support that uh, guys do. But ultimately, the people like me, we're targeting small businesses. We want to help small businesses grow. Um, and pretty much what you said there is is let small MD, small businesses get experience to people like myself to enable them to make sure that that sales process is a positive one rather than a negative one. Um, and we also support larger businesses if they've got projects or they need to grow to the next level. But ultimately, any business that's struggling to grow, worried about the pipeline, need a bit of additional resource and support from a sales perspective, then give us geeks a shout because we're more than willing to give you, give you help. Fantastic. Oh, and I forgot to do it last time, but um, maybe I can be a sales geek one day too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whether this, which, whichever one they are. <laughs>